here at the Dhamma Dharini Monastery, we've enjoyed a couple of uh, blissful days of being fairly quiet and having no major deadlines. Uh, this is following upon uh, the accomplishment this past weekend uh, where we established a SEMA boundary. That's something technical that uh, is needed by the monastic Sangha. We established a SEMA boundary and had a, an ordination a ceremony with um, uh, two candidates and visiting bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, and people coming from distant countries to participate. Mm, so much excitement, uh, so many decisions. For myself, there were some things that I should have done that I didn't do. There were some things that I should not have done that I did do in the course of trying to take care of all of the activities that had to be done on a deadline. We know that in life, people are faced all the time with uh, choices and uh, we do our best. Uh, rarely is it perfect. And there can be agitation that can arise because of having um, these uh, ideas about what should be done or what should not be done. So uh, just in case anybody has got any uh, emotional feelings uh, somewhere in the mind that may come up during this meditation, uh, just in case you have any problems in your life that might rise up during this meditation and invite, get you to, uh, you know, think about the problems or uh, try to solve the problems and so on. In case there are dreams and uh, wishes uh, that might come along as daydreams about how things could be differently. I would like to invite you to make a determination of forgiveness. Uh, this is the nature of the mind to be always doing its activities. And at, at some level, uh, the mind or the emotions or the thoughts are always uh, somehow uh, supposed to be for our benefit. Uh, what would make things more perfect, more better? Uh, what would be for our success? what would be for our uh, safety, uh, uh, what would be uh, for comfort. And uh, it, can't, it can't just be forced to stop. Well, my idea for this meditation is to take up a standard ordinary process of meditation, watching the breath, uh, settle down, put the thoughts and problems to the side, uh, come into contact with the object of meditation, and make the determination to stay there, to keep the mind as steady and peaceful and um, connected and open and mindful and aware as, po as possible, to be uh, fully aware of just how it is to be quiet, open and mindful in this awareness of the flow of arising and passing on of every in-breath and every out-breath. But if your connection to the breath uh, wavers or becomes weak or distracted, or if you lose that altogether and find yourself thinking about something else. Please understand this is the important opportunity that the mind gives us in meditation 
to be able to see how the mind is, how the mind works. And then with that uh, super compassionate attitude, uh, like uh, the wise uh, physician or like a really good parent who knows how to be a good parent uh, would see this has gone you know, out of balance in some little way. What's really happening here? And then with that understanding, like what the significance, why, why does the mind wander? What happens when the mind wanders? What's it like when the mind wanders? Just seeing it like a physician, seeing the symptoms of in the body to, to measure the health or illness of the body with uh, sympathy, with intuition, understand the meaning. And then uh, if you know how, then to, uh, with kindness, uh, set it right again, uh, set the bones straight, use the, uh, the touch, uh, like use awareness to hold the activity of the mind in a um, calming embrace. Uh, maybe the doctor is a pediatrician and he's got a little baby, so he can hold the baby in this very calm way and it helps the baby to calm down. Or maybe they know how to practice Reiki and they can use touch to help whatever is agitated or troubled or disturbed to help it to calm down. I'm going to give just a regular guided meditation, very normal, ordinary one. But if your mind wanders, use that forgiveness, that wisdom, that kindness, and that uh, seeing every problem as the opportunity to really observe this human mind that we've got. And how the mind can come away from disturbance or uh, delusion or upset and come towards uh, calmness, wisdom, peace, and freedom. And so with that preamble, let us try uh, sitting for meditation. Uh, dear friends, uh, we are continuing with this idea about ending the war, uh, learning how to practice for peace. Uh, for some reason, um, uh, I've had this idea that's uh, been coming along for the past week or so about views and opinions. Uh, isn't it true that the most uh, vicious uh, quarrels can um, be uh, perpetuated uh, because of differences in opinions, even more so than um, about uh, uh, a person's, uh, let's say, materialistic needs for um, uh, food or wealth or um, fighting over a girl or something like that. Um, uh, the differences that we have in opinions, in our uh, religious doctrines, in our ideas about uh, right and wrong, uh, uh, differences in the uh, way that our, our values are uh, come to be um, enunciated in a way that they're kind of a, a rallying cry for people to uh, um, I should, could say gang up or to 
to know uh, who's uh, who's on your side and who's who's on the other side. In um, even in everyday life, we uh, live uh, here in the monastic community. Uh, we live in a uh, a world which is uh, somewhat uh, sheltered from the uh, conflict or the um, the constant uh, a tangle of uh, diversity of of different viewpoints, uh, because in the community, uh, most of us uh, here have uh, really uh, taken on board uh, the the basic uh, teachings of the Buddha, and um, and this is uh, the thing. Uh, what we are united about these are the, the values that we are are um, uh, coming together about and uh, that creates a lot of of harmony and uh, relieves a lot of uh, um, uh, stress or potential for stress uh, within uh, community life i could uh, uh, contrast it with uh, a different kind of an organization um, before i ordained I owned a condominium and board, you know, the board of the condominium. So what do they all have in common? Preserving their wealth. And, and so that was not a very uh, stable or um, uh, unifying uh, theme. Uh, people could uh, much, easy, much more easily get into uh, uh, tangles about their, their different values. Uh, but if, if uh, I suppose if, uh, that our condo board uh, remembered to just focus on that one thing and to let the other uh, problems go to the side. They could have avoided a lot of arguments. Uh, here in here in the monastery, you know, uh, there's dukkha. There's the arising of dukkha, uh, the uh, cessation of dukkha, and the way to the cessation of dukkha. And uh, we're all together on that. Uh, but then, when it comes to should we uh, change our, our procedure and have breakfast at 6.30 instead of having breakfast at seven o'clock or something like that, then uh, there's actually a potential for this little like trepidation, this sort of like shakiness. So people have different ideas, uh, different uh, wishes, different preferences and, and where these preferences are coming from is it comes from the body, you know, am I the kind of person who's always good in the morning or someone who's uh, difficult in the morning and that half hour is going to be, uh, be kind of like hard on me. And so, and so uh, it, there's nothing in the teachings of the Buddha that is actually telling us uh, what time to, to have breakfast. And so then uh, uh, we need to uh, uh, see how we could uh, overcome the potentially uh, different uh, uh, views and opinions that uh, somebody could have on a, on a question like that. Uh, a much more serious uh, question for us is about COVID safety and how um, conservative uh, uh, we should be or how relaxed we should be uh, with the uh, uh, possibility of uh, one of the members of our community getting COVID. Uh, and again, it, you know, it has to do with a lot of like individual factors and different individuals are different. They're different in their bodily health, different in their uh, psychology or their attitude towards risk, uh, different in uh, their tendency to be, um, um, you know, anxious about disease or, you know, so many different things. And uh, 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 then if we don't have uh, take a lot of care, it could actually be possible for a community, even a Buddhist community, to be kind of like torn apart by uh, different opinions. Let's say we could have a meeting for, um, and spend an hour or two thinking about what time to have breakfast. And, you know, finally, everybody's so exhausted and tired of the meeting, they, they agree on one time or another to have breakfast. Uh, but uh, 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 
some uh, member of our community internally doesn't really agree with it. And so then they could carry around um, uh, some kind of like an idea, like a negativity, you know, like, oh, that was dumb. They made a dumb decision. Why did they do that, make that decision? I'm using a silly example because I'm scared to mention any of the real examples <laughs> of things that, that uh, you know, can cause uh, uh, people to, to uh, disagree. And, and, so, and so we, um, uh, the only, well, we're lucky that we have other forms, you know, that have been talked about in the, in the past uh, uh, weeks about having the uh, inclination towards communal harmony in terms of uh, creating a safe space for practice. And uh, so like uh, one of our um, practices is uh, if we have a meeting and if we uh, are talking about a question, if we, if the, we come to a decision, then uh, uh, not to complain about it or to try to undermine that decision later on after you've agreed to it, you know, so, so, but um, um, in uh, uh, what I, what I thought would be useful and what I'm going to uh, try to develop uh, actually during the next week or more than one week is looking a bit more deeply about what the, in Buddhism is called samaditi, our right view, our perfect view. Then there's another idea in Buddhism, uh, which is called diti, our views, views or opinions. And diti is considered to be a tremendous danger, a hazard, a cause of conflict. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, people can, one of the types of clinging is clinging to views, uh, which is a great, uh, tremendous source of suffering as something that keeps us in turmoil, keeps us spinning around in samsara, uh, that is a, a cause for a, um, a, a conflict. So then uh, what is this difference? In um, uh, Buddhism, there's actually two different uh, general patterns that you sometimes see when they're talking about views. Uh, one is that there's right view and there's wrong view. You see this, for example, in uh, uh, the Sutta in the Middle Length Discourse is called the Great Forty, uh, which is about the Eightfold Noble Path. It mentions that at each uh, stage of the Eightfold Noble Path, you need to have right view uh, to know the difference between right and wrong or the difference between correct and incorrect. Uh, so uh, like um, right speech is uh, a speech which is uh, uh, truthful, uh, beneficial, gentle, and uh, not frivolous, useful. And then uh, wrong speech is speech that is untruthful, um, harmful, uh, harsh, and uh, uh, frivolous or useless. And so your right view enables you to distinguish between right speech and wrong speech, and then tells you what to do to make the attempt to uh, avoid or give up wrong speech and to uh, cultivate and develop right speech. Um, so then in this way, right view is sort of like a series of opposites. Um, there's another example of um, right view that we see uh, quite often in the suttas. Um, it starts with uh, uh, the idea, um, wrong view is if you think that there's no action and no result of action, that's the idea of karma, that if you think that your ethical intentional behaviors do not have any results, that's a wrong view. Um, but if you think that your actions do have results, that's a right view. If you think that you don't have any duties towards mother and father, that's a wrong view. If you think you do have duties towards mother and father, that's a right view, and so on. So 
then the right and wrong view is given out as this series of, of polarities. And I think you can almost begin to see there's like kind of like a, a danger in that, uh, that you would tend to either beat yourself up if you find yourself um, falling on the wrong side of that black and white dichotomy, or you would you could um, uh, be um, uh, shunning or uh, scolding other people who uh, express something which is in um, falling on the wrong side of that that black and white uh, dichotomy, uh, and uh, uh, one could become uh, quite uh, sort of like a rigid. Uh, so that if if uh, when we're in a meeting and uh, you had a a thought that was not like the kind of thought that you're supposed to have at the particular moment, then you you like suppress and you won't you won't you wouldn't dare to uh, speak your truth because your truth is not or your your thought at the moment is not fitting into the uh, majority at that time, and it becomes like kind of like stultifying or negative towards community. So that kind of uh, this is called a mundane right view, and it is necessary and useful, especially at the beginning of our path. Uh, uh, but how we take them uh, should not be as uh, we take it on hearsay, we take it by the majority opinion, uh, we take it by um, the voice of an authority or some uh, famous teacher or something we read in a book or uh, something we read in our catechism, uh, but instead uh, it might be more wise to uh, uh, take those ideas as a kind of a hypothesis uh, that we may test by trying them out with our own experience and uh, find out like if I practice, if I make the effort to develop right speech as it was explained to me, does that bring me more happiness or does it bring me more misery? Does it cause more happiness or misery to the people around me while I'm uh, uh, developing right speech and so on like that? Uh, there's a more subtle form of right view, which is getting into the middle path. Uh, so there's the view that um, the soul or the self is eternal and will live forever. And the view that uh, the soul or the self is uh, uh, not eternal and uh, is uh, annihilated at the uh, end of a lifetime. And uh, both of those views are taught by the Buddha to be incorrect extremist views, uh, but rather uh, the Buddha teaches uh, the middle way of causation, that everything that exists arises because of causes and conditions. It continues as long as the supportive conditions exist. And when the conditions cease, um, then it ceases. So everything is arising and ceasing according to conditions. That's uh, like a, there's an apparent um, irreconcilable dichotomy between this uh, black and white. Uh, but the, the, uh, uh, the task of uh, like wisdom is uh, finding a new synthesis, a different way, which, uh, is coming at a, at a different level of thought uh, that resolves that, those apparent dichotomies. In a certain kind of way, uh, you could say that it's like um, uh, the scientific method in Western thought. If you taught science and you learned um, uh, the different, uh, I guess, uh, uh, Newton's theories, you know, for every action, there's a reaction, or uh, if you learned uh, uh, geometry, or if you learned um, 
uh, biology, I guess we had to learn that there's like the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom and all those kingdoms. And, uh, you know, these things that we learn in science as being like scientific facts. Um, but that's truly not what science is about. What science is about is scientific method. It's a way of having a, a theory or a concept uh, that we may uh, test against actual reality as it arises, as it appears to us, and uh, does the theory fit the reality? And then as you investigate more and more closely and you look more deeply, you can may find that you had a really great theory that um, has worked for thousands of years and it explains a lot of different things, but oh, here's something that doesn't get explained by this theory. And then uh, uh, in the scientific method, you may um, have uh, uh, some kind of like a creative process of uh, uh, reflecting and looking for patterns and uh, having a new uh, uh, theory uh, to explain the anomaly and then uh, testing that and finding out whether it that theory explains that anomaly. That's, that's the scientific method for the purpose of more knowledge. Uh, so what's our scientific method in Buddhism? And what is this purpose? What is its purpose? Okay, so uh, the purpose of Buddhism is not to get more and more knowledge. Uh, the purpose of Buddhism is the end of suffering. And so when they say in summary of the right view that uh, for the perfect view is understanding dukkha, the arising, the cause of dukkha, the cessation of dukkha, and the way to the cessation of dukkha. It's not that they're giving you four facts to put in your catechism. Uh, the Buddha is giving us, this is the method. This is the fundamental method that we can use to uh, examine our experience. However far along we've come on our path of practice, uh, we've uh, learned a few things. Uh, perhaps we were had the good luck to uh, meet a, a virtuous or even a noble uh, teacher who uh, showed us how to the way to live. And um, and uh, we took that advice to heart and tried it out and find out that, yes, by following these suggestions, by uh, thinking in this way, by looking at things in this way, I can see my suffering goes down and down and down. And my welfare, my happiness is more and more stabilized. And um, I can see that um, as I look at the people around me and the, the impact that I have on people around me, that I'm, I'm not causing harm uh, the way perhaps I used to be when I didn't know anything. Uh, uh, but then even as we practice, even as a more subtle level, we may discover there's some like anomaly uh, that comes along even though we've been practicing for years, we may find a, uh, oh, um, I'm waking up feeling depressed today. What's this about? And then one can investigate this, you know, as an anomaly, like we've, we've uh, mastered the teaching so far, uh, but there's something, uh, some way we've not fully gotten hold of it. Something that's causing, um, I give that example, depression, or it's causing a disturbance, or it's causing, a flare up of anger, or it's causing a flare up of fear, uh, causing a flare up of some kind of uh, uh, reactivity. And so then uh, uh, this is the opportunity to use the Buddhist scientific method and to uh, really look uh, as fully as we can to like really grok What's going on here that's created this disturbance? That's the fully understand dukkha. And then uh, 
in the course of Dukkha, uh, the tip that the Buddha gave us is a craving. So is there something that I'm craving that I, I might even not have realized that I have some craving or I have some attachment? Um, it's like being the fish in water, you don't know that you crave to live in water. Being um, in whatever status in the world you have, you might not know that you are craving to have that particular kind of status until it's until there's some disturbance in um, in your in your position in life. Or having a certain kind of body, uh, uh, if you were lucky enough to have a healthy body, uh, you might not know how much your um, just have always just assumed that this healthy body is part of life until uh, there's some disturbance in that. And then so that then when, when there's that reaction, when the promise of this, the peace and freedom, the happiness, the equanimity, the, uh, the highest good, uh, uh, when we see that it's fallen short, that there's some kind of a shadow or a disturbance or an upset, this happened to that, then uh, we, can, uh, we can apply this, um, the Buddhist scientific method, uh, see what the cause is, and then uh, find out how to uh, relinquish that craving right there and uh, know that what we've relinquished is uh, that our, that's right there is where we, we experience um, the release from that dukkha. Uh, so then um, all of the um, uh, doctrines and uh, lists of the uh, uh, Buddhist uh, system and all of the uh, norms of ethical behavior are all good supports, uh, but they don't comprise right view held. They're not right view if they're clung to. None of them are right view if you're clinging to them. If you're clinging to any part uh, then it can be the cause of disturbance, a cause of unhappiness, a cause of suffering, even a cause of harm to oneself and to others. I do want to uh, encourage you to, to see it's, it's quite um, easy uh, to, to find a, a kind of a, a conflict between uh, different uh, suttas that you find uh, even in the, in the, um, even within the Theravada, within the Pali Canon of our school of Buddhism, not to mention the other schools of Buddhism, in the uh, Sutta Nipata especially, there are many uh, teachings that are uh, expressing the idea that uh, one should not cling to any views at all, uh, that views are the cause of dispute, and. Um, it's putting up the image of the debating society uh, where different uh, uh, scholars or different uh, uh, thinkers are, I think maybe they're in a hall and you know, different like pairs of people are yelling at each other. And, um, uh, or maybe it could be like a talk show. Uh, uh, and, they, and they are uh, using their words and ideas as, weapons to try to defeat another person. And, um, and then as a reaction against that, um, the, the Buddha is saying, I don't cling to any views at all. Uh, but then in other suttas, we see it quite clearly enunciated that this is right speech, this is wrong speech. This is 
uh, right intention, this is wrong intention. This is right ethical behavior, wrong behavior. This is right livelihood, wrong livelihood. Uh, you see these pairs that are very, you know, clearly, uh, clearly laid out. Um, so uh, in the uh, a simile of the snake, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Buddha uh, gave the, um, well, he gave a simile of a snake and he also gave a simile of a raft in that same sutta. And uh, he said that my teachings are like a raft. You use the raft to cross the river. After you get across the, the, the dangerous uh, river, uh, you don't then uh, go on carrying this raft with you. You leave the raft behind. Uh, so um, all of those uh, teachings that you have that are in these uh, dichotomies, these pairs of black and white, you can use those as your raft to get over the river. Um, but uh, don't plan on clinging to them. Uh, definitely do not plan on using them as a, a, a reason to accuse or condemn anybody else. And uh, uh, be prepared instead to uh, rely on this more line, on this underlying method of this approach, um, the method of um, especially the Four Noble Truths, uh, which is a kind of a, um, an approach that can be applied to any problem or any circumstance that we encounter uh, for the purpose of the end of suffering. Uh, so these are my uh, thoughts for this evening. And uh, we have a uh, a bit of time for any uh, questions, uh, especially if anything I said was um, uh, confusing or uh, seemed incorrect, um, uh, please let me know. Sadhu, sadhu.